Hi, this is a lecture on Plato's Apology. My name is David Hildebrand, and I'm at the University of Colorado, Denver. Take a look briefly at the lifespans of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Socrates, of course, was the teacher of Plato, and Plato was the teacher of Aristotle. You can see on the timeline that they overlapped, Socrates and Plato, and of course Plato and Aristotle, but Socrates and Aristotle did not overlap. Take a look, too, at the wider historical context. A lot of people know that Plato and Aristotle and Socrates lived a long time ago, but this timeline gives a sense of what else was going on in the world at the time. This lecture is organized around some pivotal ideas related to Socrates, Plato, and the dialogue, the Apology. One is about how we fix belief or convince people. Argument and persuasion are two different ways. Socrates, of course, is typically featured in dialogues using what has come to be called the elenchus, or a kind of cross-examination procedure. The dialogue ends in different ways, ways that can also have an effect on how we believe things. They end inconclusively in a sort of aporia versus more conclusive kinds of endings that we see in other fields. Socrates also refers to philosophy as a kind of midwifery, a sort of bringing into the world something which exists in a nascent form but is not fully developed. Another pivotal idea is what we hold in mind, right? What is the difference between knowledge and opinion? What is the difference in this dialogue between what Socrates refers to as human wisdom versus what he refers to as divine wisdom? Two different kinds of thinkers are portrayed in the, in the dialogue philosopher, which is Socrates, and the sophists, which his accusers call him a sophist. There were sophists around at the time, but Socrates makes it very clear that he is not a sophist, and he gives us his reasons why. Finally, the dialogue takes up and helps to delineate the difference between and the relations between virtue and knowledge, especially the relation between knowing what each virtue is, right, their definition, which is what Socrates is often questing for, and the activity of being virtuous, right, putting those definitions, putting courage into action and into words, of course, and these things as a whole can combine to create an examined and meaningful life. So this is when virtuous actions become habitual. The life that is lived is called, examined by Socrates, and we might simply call it meaningful. I'll offer an outline of my lecture in just a moment, but you should know the outline of the Apology. It begins with Socrates' introduction, including his outlines of the defense to come, and then his defense against the older accusers. He moves next to a defense against the newer accusers, and this contains the cross-examination of his prosecutor, Miletus. After this, you see Socrates' exhortation to virtue, and the verdict comes down and the penalty is assessed. Now, Socrates was allowed to offer his own penalty as an alternative, and so we have a section where Socrates offers a counter-assessment of the penalty, what he thinks he deserves. After this, the re-verdict comes back, and Socrates offers then some parting words to those who voted, both to convict and also those who voted to acquit. So that's what happens in the Apology. Now, the outline of this lecture, we're going to begin with a question about a central puzzle in the Apology, namely how talk or discussion or conversation can be central to the good life. Why is that? We'll then look at the context of the dialogue and the importance of impiety as an issue, particularly the ways that Socrates is challenging the Greek piety in two different ways. Then we'll look at the introduction Socrates gives, especially his emphasis on the fact that he won't be trying to persuade anybody. And then we'll see the accusations against Socrates and his distinction between human wisdom, divine wisdom, and how he's motivated to make this distinction by the oracle at Delphi. We'll move on and talk about how Socrates thinks he's doing a public service by philosophizing, and even why he'll continue philosophizing, though it will lead to his death. We'll talk about the larger purposes of philosophy for Socrates, and then we'll go back and take up the verdict, the penalty, and Socrates' counteroffer to the penalty in the sequence of events in the dialogue. Finally, we'll talk about the re-verdict that they uh, give him and the penalty there, and we'll conclude with some discussion as to why philosophy and sophistry are different 
and the words that Socrates speaks to both the people who voted to convict him and the people who supported him and voted to acquit him. So let's begin with a central puzzle in the Apology, that is, how talk is central to the good life. Now, in the dialogue, we hear the following words from Socrates. He says, It is the greatest good for a man to discuss virtue every day, and those other things about which you hear me conversing and testing myself and others, for the unexamined life is not worth living for a human being. And that's at 38a. So the central question in philosophy, as, as this course is, is framing it, is what gives life meaning? And Socrates is giving us a clue in this quote about how someone can craft a fulfilling and an interesting individual life, and how someone who is a social being, which we're all social beings, can make society better. So think about the quotation for a moment. I mean, doesn't it seem incredible that the greatest good could require discussion and that a life without this kind of critical conversation with others might not only be inferior, but not be worth living at all? We have to think about and try to understand why he says this, especially that qualifier at the end, not worth living at all. Because I think a lot of us assume that if one gets a you know, good job with good pay, one will have at least what they need to lead at least a minimally happy life. So what is worth more than our financial and our material security? What else could we need? And how is talking, conversation, dialogue, powerful enough to attain these things? So let's move now to the context of the dialogue. It's 399 BCE, that's before Common Error, and Socrates has been indicted for impiety, which is either not believing in right, the official gods or believing in different gods. Socrates exploits this confusion by Miletus, but the author of the charges in this dialogue was the influential Anatus, one of the two chief democrats restored by the counter-revolution in 403. Now, the actual prosecutor in the dialogue, Miletus, was Anatus's proxy. Miletus was relatively obscure and insignificant, so obviously Anatus is putting sort of a newer, less known person up to prosecute the famous Socrates, so this seems like kind of a, a covering maneuver, but that's just sort of speculation on my part. So we come in when the trial is underway, and the defendant has the right to make a defense, right? This is the apologia, or the apology, or the defense. Now, Socrates is before speaking before a large audience. There are about a 501 people on the jury, and they're going to vote based on the evidence that they are hearing. And the final vote against Socrates, not to give anything away, but the final vote against Socrates is 281 to 220. The audience is considerably larger than 500. Please consider for a moment the central charge against Socrates, the charge of impiety. What does this mean? What does it mean to be charged with impiety? Well, consider for a moment how many people in our country react to those that they hear burn the flag or kneel at a football game in protest. I mean, think about the anger the dissent generates. Think about people who insult the institution of the family, say families are not important, who, who say, who maybe criticize our economic system and say capitalism is evil or socialism is better. Now, I mean, the criticisms of capitalism, criticisms of the family, criticisms of burning of the flag, these are all activities which generate not just disagreement, but intense disagreement. Such critics who act in this way are often condemned with very strong language and very powerful emotion. Why? Well, they have to be more than just factually wrong. I mean, it's not just that people think that capitalist systems are just factually better than socialist systems. There's something energizing that defense of capitalism or that defense of the family. And what is at the core of these reactions is a threat to sort of traditional values. The values they're that are being questioned are considered to be core, or foundational, or grounding. These are the values that orient our way of life, and so challenges to them really shake us and make us angry because, in part, we become fearful. So this charge of impiety against Socrates is a serious one for emotional and psychological and social reasons as well as 
sort of logical or factual reasons. I think that's good to keep in mind. Socrates is challenging Greek piety in two ways. On the one hand, he's refusing to automatically accept the God myths, right, the ones that are found in Homer, as true. And he is refusing to automatically accept customary values, right? He thinks that they require argument, analysis, critical thinking, and then perhaps they can be affirmed, but they cannot be affirmed or accepted automatically. So Socrates' defense here of of these automatic acceptance of values or beliefs is a challenge to authority, right? It's a challenge to blind acceptance. And we see then that Socrates is really pushing for a different kind of citizenship in Athens. One that is, let's say, citizenry by reasoning and rationality rather than citizenry by faith, like blind obedience or blind allegiance, right? This would be a patriotism to reason, not a patriotism that's necessarily to the state or what's necessarily what's, right, characteristic of Athens. So in other words, we see Socrates challenging pieties, right, the ones that are delivered frequently by poetry or myth or religion in ways that are, right, delivered oracularly, handed down, told in stories, coming from oracles that have to be believed and be emulated, right? So the the belief, like, let's say the belief is, be like Achilles. Socrates is saying, well, maybe you should be like Achilles, but what is Achilles like, right? Would that be the right thing to do? Is that the rational thing to do? So Socrates is challenging this entire approach to how we discover and accept our values and define our virtues. The upshot to this is that in Socrates' mind, you cannot be truly pious, you cannot have values if you are just a blind, faithful parrot of conventional beliefs. Right? So you, you have to be a thoughtful, thinking, examining person. So if we go now to the introduction of the dialogue, we see Socrates promising. He's promising to convince by argument and not by persuasion. So if you take a look at 17a through d, you'll see Socrates basically promising not to try to trick anyone or persuade anyone using emotion. We need to think about why he's doing this. Why is he promising to convince by argument and not persuasion? Well, a couple of reasons that, that occur are that Socrates is trying to distinguish himself from the sophists, right? He's not teaching people how to talk in clever ways, and he's not charging people fees to speak in clever rhetorical ways and win cases in the law court. And he also wants to distinguish himself from skeptics and relativists, right? So he's going to use reason and argument. He's not going to be a sophist, nor is he a skeptic or a relativist. Now, the accusations against Socrates were numerous, and they accumulated over a long period, including some which were articulated to comic effect by the poet Aristophanes. Some of the accusations include Socrates being a scientist, that is, he's someone who busies himself with things above and below the sky. Of course, this would be impious because these are, if you're a scientist, you're treating them as material things and not as gods. Socrates also is accused of being a sophist, and this, this comes out in the accusation that Socrates is someone who makes the weaker argument into the stronger. So this is, of course, someone who is doing something untrustworthy, right? They're pulling a bait and switch. So it's worth thinking about what that means, making the weaker argument into the stronger, and how people can do this. And if you look at advertising or marketing or the speeches of politicians, we see often that emotional appeals, dramatic language are used in commercials, whether it's to promote a certain policy in politics or whether it's to convince people to buy a certain product. The common thread there is to use emotion over rational evidence, right, to make the weaker case into the stronger using emotion and desire as sort of maneuvers there. Now, Socrates is denying that he's doing this. And they ask him, okay, well then what do you do, Socrates? And this is where Socrates starts to enter into his story of how he came to philosophize. And he defends himself by a story about the oracle at Delphi. 
So it's good to notice that Socrates is framing his life's quest, right, to be a philosopher, as a response to an oracular statement from, effectively, Apollo. Now, this is obviously not someone who is prima facie impious. So Socrates is denying the charges that he is, right, a persuader, and he explains that he only has, quote, human wisdom, end quote. And he explains that wisdom, what this means, what wisdom means to him, with the story of the visit to the oracle at Delphi by um, Chariphon. So what happened at Delphi? What did the oracle say? Well, Chariphon went and visited the oracle, and he was told that no one is wiser than Socrates. For example, take a look at 21a. So we can look at what Socrates' response was to this news. What did he do? Well, he didn't go around pounding his chest talking about how he was the greatest, he was the wisest. He thought, what could this possibly mean? Because I don't feel that I'm wise, and yet the oracle says it. So he adopts the mission of trying to see if the prophecy is true, and particularly to see what the prophecy means. So he goes around testing people in in Athens, in his society, who claimed to be wise, who claimed to know things. He asked them a series of difficult questions, like the ones we saw him asking Euthyphro. Typically, these would be definitions or very general accounts of values that are integral to living a meaningful life. What is justice? What is piety? What is friendship? What is virtue? And what does Socrates find when he questions people? Well, if you look at 22a, where he talks about speaking with the craftsmen and the politicians and the poets, Socrates discovers that these people, who are all reputed to be so wise, cannot give very good or even any general accounts of what beauty is, what justice is, and so forth. And in fact, their pride in what they are able to do makes them unable to know more and makes them overconfident about their ability to know things. So often, the ability to know something very well in one area leads them to basically shoot their mouth off about everything else. So human wisdom turns out to be not a positive or specific definition of the virtues, but the absence of false conceit of having knowledge, right? So Socrates says human wisdom is knowing that he does not know. That attitude of humility or openness is what's required to learn anything new and, of course, to gain wisdom eventually. One of the things Socrates says in his own defense is that he's doing a public service for Athens. Now, why do you think Socrates believed that he was doing the people of Athens a public service? Well, he was getting people to examine their ideas, the way a physician or a nutritionist might get us to examine how we're eating, whether we're exercising enough, whether we're taking care of ourselves. But he's like a physician for their souls, their character. And he thought they could prosper as individuals and as a nation state only if they took care of themselves and their other citizens. So Socrates is thinking that this is, of course, a wonderful thing that he's doing for them, this critical thinking, this critical questioning, this seeking of definitions. It's quite clear that continuing to philosophize will lead to Socrates' death, and yet he won't stop. And he insists on philosophizing even if he's commanded to stop or even if he's exiled. Why isn't Socrates willing to stop philosophizing even though it could lead to these terrible outcomes? Well, I think there are at least three very important reasons offered in the dialogue. One is that for Socrates, justice is more important than merely living. And if you look at 28b and 28d, you can see him talking about this. Socrates says that he has been commanded by the god to pursue a philosophic mission. And so for Socrates, piety is reverence for the truth as discovered by logic and argument. And so he cannot live reverently, piously, and stop questioning. He's been divinely charged to philosophize. So justice is more important than merely living, and justice cannot be attained without critical, rational inquiry. The second reason is that, well, death is unknown. And so fearing the unknown is fearing what one is ignorant of. And it doesn't make any sense to be afraid of something that you know nothing about. A third reason offered in the dialogue is, I think, relates to the original quote about the unexamined life. 
and that is that morality is more important than mortality. And he says that fear's proper object, right, the thing that we should fear is not death, but doing wrong. And we need to worry not about dying, but about how we're behaving in this life and stop worrying about what will happen to us in the next. So Socrates is very concerned about the way that people's fear of their physical death shapes their actions the, and how the concern for the future, uh, even of their soul, shapes their actions. And Socrates is saying, what you do to your soul, what you do to your character or personality is most important in this life. And that is the primary thing that anybody should worry about and what philosophy is pursuing. So this gets back to the larger purposes of philosophy for Socrates. Philosophy is the care of the soul, the care of our character, our personality. This is a moral activity, and Socrates feels obligated, morally obligated, to carry it out. Athens, in order to take care of its own soul, has to pursue inquiry, Socrates is saying, and he's cautioning his accusers, don't kill me, I'm the one who's trying to help your city. And this is where the metaphor of the gadfly and the horse is directed. So the gadfly stings the horse, the horse is Athens, Athens is this big sluggish horse, and the gadfly is stinging it and getting it to move and, and get into motion. And Socrates goes on to argue that death, it's going to come, and it is preferable to abandoning a morally worthy mission. So you might just think for a moment about those who are devoted journalists or charity workers who are helping in another country. You might ask, well, why don't they stop even though it's very dangerous? Most don't get glamorous rewards or high pay out of it. And so there's something preferable about doing a morally worthy mission even when it could lead to harm or death. So the verdict comes back and Socrates is found guilty. And there was no statutory penalty for the charges on which Socrates had just been convicted. And so the prosecution had to propose an appropriate penalty, and the defense had to make a counterproposal. The prosecution proposed the death penalty, and Socrates is given the opportunity to respond. He's given the opportunity to offer a penalty that he thinks is more appropriate. So Socrates proposes a f pension or free meals for life, he can't honestly propose self-punishment because he thinks he's innocent and he rejects imprisonment. He rejects even a small fine, which he says he couldn't pay because of his poverty. And he rejects exile, which seems ridiculous because he says, somewhat ironically, that he would be as dangerous in another city as he is in Athens. Plus, he also has already told us that he can't stop philosophizing because that would be a kind of disobedience to Apollo. So his offer of free meals at the Prytaneum where the Olympic athletes dine is offered, even though it comes across as a laughable and even a snarky counteroffer. So Socrates is provoking the court with this. We have to ask ourselves why he does this. So the punishment is delivered, right? The re-verdict comes back and Socrates is again found guilty and the punishment is affirmed as death. And so it seems that Socrates' conviction is the result of his not playing along, being maybe melodramatic for the jury or being dramatic, I'm not sure, and not caving into the smaller penalties or to the proposal of exile. And so what Socrates wants to make people confront is that there are principles worth dying for and that avoiding death is easy, but avoiding wickedness is hard. So both at the beginning of the dialogue and at the end, Socrates distances himself from the sophists. Why do you think that he was so concerned that he not be thought a sophist? So if you think about it, Socrates is advocating that we pursue genuine knowledge. And genuine knowledge concerns the things which are, not just the things which appear to be. Wisdom has a real moral impact and it cannot be confused with persuasion. So you might just run through your mind a little bit and try to think of a distinction like the one between sophist and philosopher that exists today. Think about the difference between, say, being in the news 
or the entertainment business, believing in science, pursuing science, or magic? What's the difference between knowledge and opinion, between education and propaganda, between fact and fiction? And one further thing that we might discuss is that if we accept Socrates' point that a philosopher performs an important function in a society by making it critical, by making it ask hard questions, by making it pursue general accounts of the most important concepts and values and virtues, who are our philosophers? So finally, we come to the conclusion Socrates' words to those who voted to convict him and those who voted to acquit him and his supporters in the audience. Socrates concludes with a prophecy, one for his convictors, uh, and he prophesizes vengeance on them, right? Vengeance that his followers and that other people who have taken up this practice of asking questions, of performing the elenchus, of trying to get definitions of concepts and values and ideas, will continue to do this and will continue to ask hard questions of people in power, people with influence. Socrates also offers a moral lesson about death to his supporters. And he says to them, you shouldn't fear death because either death is a dreamless sleep or it's a new place for the soul where we can have conversations with famous people and continue the quest for knowledge, the quest for wisdom. He also says to them that a good person cannot be harmed in life or death. Why? Because, as he says to his accusers, you can kill me, but you cannot harm me. And what this means is that our character, our soul, our personality, who, who we are, is up to us because our actions are up to us. There are all sorts of accidents that may befall us, all sorts of people or diseases that may attack us, but how we respond to those things, who we are in the face of those dangers, stresses, threats, show us who we are, and that is something which is up to us. So this concludes this lecture on Plato's Apology. Socrates has been convicted, he's been sentenced to death, and now he's going off to jail for about a month. And this is the scene and context of the next dialogue in this series, the Crito. And so we see that Socrates is going to have a chance to escape in the Crito, and we're going to see his reasons for refusing to do that. Thanks so much for listening. I look forward to talking with you soon.